Welcome to this guide on the many elements that make up Total Conflict Resistance's main campaign, along with explanations and examples of how they all work within the game. While some of this may seem self-explanatory and not need an entire section dedicated to it, this is a general guide on most aspects of the game and how they work, so we will be covering most elements. If there is something you do not see in this guide, let us know down in the comments. Let's begin. After starting up the game and clicking anywhere on this screen, you will be met with the main menu. Click on the new game option near the top of this list on the left. The next screen will show a few campaigns to choose from, and at the time of this recording, two of them are locked. Therefore, we will select the 2024 campaign for this guide. After selecting the campaign, we now get to choose our faction. All factions get their own unique starting location, with the faction types separated by either being Democratic, Communist, or a Rebel faction. For this guide, we will be picking the Democratic Nation of Sombro. After selecting your faction, you now get to choose your difficulty. For this guide, we will pick the highest difficulty setting, Expert. Lower difficulties give an easier playstyle, such as not having to worry about resource distribution. These can be changed in the gameplay options later on. After selecting your difficulty, you will be transported to the overworld map of the campaign. Once we get past the introductional text boxes detailing the history of Cambridia and Sombro appearing in the upper left hand corner, we will have full control over the Sombro faction and its resources. You may pause this video to fully read the text if interested. Now that we are over Sombro, let's take a look at what we first see. First, we can see blue borders representing the owned territory of Sombro. You can also see your starting towns and battalions inside these borders. There is also a small battalion of rebels inside your territory. This rebel group will be your first obstacle you have to overcome. Now that we have looked at the more obvious parts of what we see, let's look at the overworld user interface. The user interface, otherwise known as the UI, contains a host of information and things to do, surrounding your screen. The UI contains the majority of elements you will need to use to win wars, build and produce, and keep your populace from rising against you. At the top of the screen we see the resource list. The resource list shows what resources are readily available to be used by your faction to build equipment, feed your populace and battalions, and generally keep your citizens in your territory happy so they do not rebel. With just a glance, this list quickly provides you information on your resources and the amounts your faction currently has access to. Hovering your cursor over a resource on this list will show which town or towns it is located in. To the center right of your screen, you can see the available cities and battalions list. Double clicking on either a town or a battalion will bring you to their location. You will also see these chevrons on the side of a battalion. The more experienced a battalion is, the more chevrons and eventually stars it will receive. More on this in part 2 of this guide. Going all the way to the lower left are your faction's government statistics. Stability is first up and based on the number of police and or battalions in your towns, along with having the right amount of food and alcohol to supply the population. Next to this are your government's percentages in overall authority, political power, and how close to a dictatorship it is. Over to the right we see the date. Here you can tell the time along with the day, month, and year it is in game. This is important to pay attention to because the campaign's environment will change along with new research options unlocking as the years progress. More information on research is coming soon. Further to the right, we see the speed settings. The speed settings simply allow you to pause, play, and triple the in-game speed. Keep in mind that speeding up or down or pausing affects both you and the other factions on the map. In the bottom right of this screen, you'll see a host of icons, the first of which is the Research, Manufacturing, and Adaption icon. When you click on the Manufacturing and Adaption icon, the Research screen will open. There are three branches of research to choose from. Weapons, Ammunition, and Vehicles. Next to the Manufacturing and Adaption icon is the Construction icon. When you click on the Construction icon, the Construction screen will open. With the left side showing your owned towns, the buildings already in them, and open slots for future construction projects. On the right side, you can see additional information about the statistics of your population inside your faction. 
Clicking on one of the town's open slots will open up a screen showing what buildings are available for that town. Keep in mind that some towns have different resources available and can build certain buildings. Examples of these are wheat fields and farms and iron or copper ore mines requiring towns with the ore symbol present above them on the overworld map. While most buildings are self-explanatory thanks to their resource symbol, others need a quick look. Here are those key buildings to help you start running your faction. Military Factories Military factories allow you to produce any and all equipment and vehicles battalions may need, provided you have the correct resources available. This applies to all the following and any buildings and supplies not mentioned in this guide. Residential Buildings Residential buildings increase your government's overall population and increase the amount of troops you can conscript into your forces. Construction Sites Construction sites will speed up building projects of future buildings for that town. Research Centers Research centers increase the speed at which you unlock new technology. Banks Banks give a lump sum of $10,000 every year. Next to the construction icon is the production icon. Clicking on the production icon will open up the production screen. This shows your towns and then what can be built in them. When you click on a highlighted resource, it will appear in the town's build list on the right. In the town that can produce it, closest to the top. Production of a resource does not immediately begin at 100% efficiency, however. It takes time for production to become more efficient. Removing or changing out the production of a resource for another will reset this counter back to 20% efficiency. Next to the production icon is the squad editor icon. Clicking on the squad editor icon will open up a screen that seems rather complex at first. However, the squad editor is simply a way for you to customize your squads based on your tactical or aesthetic needs. You can choose what weapons, armor, and vehicles you want your squads to be equipped with before they fill up at a town. You can even customize a squad's look with t-shirts and hats and even what modifications their weapons are equipped with. On the bottom of this screen, you can copy this loadout to a squad, save your options as a preset, or save the squad if you are happy with this specific loadout. Next to the squad editing icon is the diplomacy icon. When you click on the diplomacy icon, the diplomacy screen will open. This shows a list of all factions on the world map on the left. This list shows information on what treaties you have with factions and their opinion of you. A number with a plus sign next to it means that faction is more likely to work with you. A number with the minus sign next to it means that faction is more likely to not agree to a deal with you or will potentially go to war against you. On the right side, you can see a list of diplomatic options available to you. These are available to get factions to join your side, start trade deals, and make peace amongst many others. How you diplomatically engage with the other factions will impact your campaign. Next to the diplomacy icon is the trading icon. Clicking on the trading icon will open up the trading screen. This shows the current amount of money you have to buy with. Underneath that are the resources you plan on selling. You can select what resources you wish to sell on the world market from a town, but we will come back to this later. On the right side of the screen, you can see what other countries have put up for sale on the world market. Here, you can quickly get resources your faction may need, but do not have the resources or industry to produce just yet. Food, alcohol, weapons, ammo, other resources, and even vehicles can be bought here, for the right amount of money. Clicking on any item will have your faction purchase it, and it will then appear in your faction's capital city for you to distribute. Next to the trading icon is the economics icon. Clicking on the economics icon will open up the economic screen. This gives information on your available resources, how much are in stock and can be used, how much were received through trade or the world market, how much was spent for production or upkeep, and a total that was or was in possession at the end of the month. This information is tracked over the course of a 30-day cycle. Next to the economics icon is the help icon. Clicking on the help icon opens up the help screen for Total Coffee Resistance's Steam page where you can find a guide and useful tips for the game created by the Thunder Devs development team. Now, we will go take a look at cities, towns, and farms. Cities, towns, and farms produce resources for your population and war machine, but they have other uses and information contained in them as well. Let's check out the capital city of Faro. As you can see, we have more information available to us. Here, you can see the inventory of the city in the supply tab. From available manpower for battalions, your reservists, all the way down to how many individual rounds of ammunition you have can be found here. Next to the supply tab is the garrison tab. 
Here, you can see the number of squads your town is keeping inside its borders to defend against attacking forces. You can even select individual squads to see what gear they bring with them. Lower down, you will see five buttons. First up is the rearmament button. Clicking on the rearmament button will automatically assign your forces selected the best equipment inside the city, including vehicles. This can be used in conjunction with the squad editor to quickly equip squads how you like. Next to that is the Create Standard Squad button. This will create a new squad of soldiers, starting with whatever equipment is available in the town, including vehicles. Next to this is the Create Police and Militia Squad buttons. These are both very similar to the Standard Squad button, with key differences. Police inside towns help maintain stability within your territory, but do not get better armor. A Militia Squad starts with the most basic armor available, but can be upgraded later on with better equipment using the Rearmament button in any town. These squad types can be put into a battalion for offensive purposes, but will have varying degrees of success based on their equipment. On the far right of this screen is the Enter Settlement button. This button allows you to view a town from the perspective of a defending soldier. You can even change this view by pressing M and getting a bird's eye view of the map. To leave this mode, press the escape key on your keyboard and select the option back to global map. After clicking yes, you will be returned to the overworld map. Headed back to Faro, the last tab in the town menu is the forces tab, which will appear if a battalion is present in the city. Clicking this tab shows you the makeup of the battalion stationed there. If there are no battalions nearby, the Forces tab will not appear. Roger. Before we finish part 1 of this guide, let's take a quick look at trade and resource distribution in the Supply tab and how it can affect your campaign. Trade Distribution and Resources Trade. Going back to the Supply tab, clicking on any resource will bring up the Create Convoy menu. This menu allows you to do a few things with that resource. The most important among them is the ability to send that resource to another town you own. You can also send ammo, fuel, or food directly to battalions that are low in supplies. You can do this via the drop-down list on the top of this menu. Here, you can select what town or battalion you want the selected resource to be sent to. Using this drop-down menu also allows you to send extra resources to the world market to make a little cash if another faction buys that resource. If you want to return your resource to your inventory, simply click the X button in the upper left hand corner of the resource on this screen and it will be sent back to your faction's capital. You can also dump a resource if you do not plan on using it or want to quickly clear up space in a town's inventory. Keep in mind that this is permanent and those resources cannot be retrieved later. Below the drop down list is a scroll bar where you can adjust the amounts of resources you want to send either to a battalion, a town, the world market, or to dump. This is useful on harder difficulty campaigns as you can send vital resources where they are needed while being more precise with their use. Below the amount scroll bar is the repeat weekly box. Selecting this will have a certain number of resources repeatedly sent out every week to a location, depending on the amount you set in the bar above. This is good to set up so you do not manually need to move everything all the time. You still may need to distribute resources as needed, but weekly convoys will keep your population happier and your military more effective. Not to mention the stress of management at bay. The final option in the Create Convoy menu is the Move All Supplies box. Selecting this box will send all resources inside a town to another location. This will not work if the World Market or Dump are the selected locations. And that is it for part 1 of this guide. In part 2, we plan on finishing up by looking at battalions, their uses, functions on the world map, and combat.
Welcome to part 2 of this general gameplay guide for total conflict resistance. We'll finish up by looking at battalions, unit symbols, combat, and post battle results. If you have questions about economy or general faction management, check out part 1 of this guide for that information. Now, let's resume learning by taking a look at unit symbols and their meaning. Keep in mind, all unit symbols are surrounded by a rectangle, and the interior of this rectangle is what differentiates them. First, an infantry squad that is half filled will show up as a rectangle with a single slash through it. An infantry squad that is full will show as two slashes, forming an X inside the rectangle. A light armored vehicle squad will show up as an oval with a slash through it. A medium armored vehicle squad will show as an oval with two slashes through it. A heavy armor vehicle squad will show as a single oval inside the rectangle. And lastly, a mobile artillery squad will show as an oval with a dot marking the center. Now that we know how squads will show up in your battalion, we can begin to look at what you can do with battalions and the commands you can give them. Battalions are your faction's primary way to expand territory, keep enemies at bay, and take care of any rebel forces that decide to pop up within your territory. As mentioned in the Cities, Towns, and Farms segment from Part 1 of this guide, selecting a town will open up the Supply tab. Here in the bottom left corner is the Battalion Creation button. Pressing this will instantly create a new battalion, containing a single squad with one soldier in it. Waiting at a town containing reservists, weapons, and the correct ammo for those weapons will slowly increase the number of troops inside the battalion over time. It takes about 12 in-game hours to add one soldier to a battalion. Keep in mind that a battalion can have a maximum of 30 squads with 10 soldiers each, making the full battalion 300 soldiers strong. After a battalion reaches this limit, it will no longer accept new squads or soldiers until they are transferred to a town, lost in combat, or brought into another battalion. More on this later. Once your battalion is filled, or at least as filled as you would like it to be, you can begin moving it around the world map by selecting it and then right-clicking anywhere on the map. Roger that. Roger. Roger that. Roger that. Roger that. Affirmative. Roger that. After selecting a battalion, a menu will open to the left side of your screen. You will notice its name, amount of available manpower, a forces and supply tab, your squads, and then a trash can icon next to your squads. The trash icon the trash can icon can be clicked if you want to disband a squad. This can only be done when a battalion is stationed inside a town. All resources, including squad members, will be brought back into the town the battalion is stationed in and can be used to create another squad later. You can do the same with an entire battalion as well. In the battalion menu, you can also click on individual squads to see what they are equipped with. Squad positions in a battalion can be changed by selecting and dragging a squad to a new position in the squad list. The order of a squad, the order of squads in your battalion determines how they will arrive on the battlefield. Since only 10 allied squads can be on the battlefield at any given moment, this means you need to strategize based on what you know about your enemy, along with your own plans on how you want to attack them. Squads do reinforce other squads as they are lost or retreat from the battlefield, but they will only appear in the order you choose. Squad placement can critically alter how an encounter with an enemy force will end. As mentioned, squads can be exchanged between battalions to create more effective fighting forces or to reinforce a battalion that does battle more often than another. Roger this can be done by simply selecting one battalion, hovering your mouse over another, and right-clicking. This will cause the first battalion to move as it would normally, but now it is heading towards the other battalion. You will see two arrows following each other in a circle over the target. Once the battalion gets close enough, a screen will pop up with both of the battalion's names and their attached squads. Between them are two columns of arrows pointing at each other. To bring a squad into the other battalion, select the arrow in the same row as that squad, and the squad will transfer completely over to the battalion and vice versa. You can do this as many times as you like up until the other battalion runs out of squads and disappears altogether, or until the battalion you are transferring to is filled up. Now, that battalion has whatever number of squads you put into it and Roger is ready for that. battle. One final feature of battalions is one we have already covered in part 1, but it is still important enough to look at again. Individual squads make up a battalion and increase the battalion's overall experience. The chevrons next to the battalion's name on the towns and battalions list to the right will increase as the battalion wins battles. A more experienced battalion has better morale, stealth, and accuracy compared to a same strength battalion 
with the same equipment and number of troops. This experience will be affected by the number of experienced and inexperienced squads in the battalion. As you probably saw earlier, battalions can be moved around the map. They can be moved to intercept, attack, defend, and increase stability in a town, or they can be left in the middle of your territory to respond to threats that appear. If you bring a battalion into a town to defend it, it will appear in tactical battles with some of its squads taking up defensive positions if a garrison is not present. Having vehicles in the squad supplied with gasoline will allow them to move much quicker across the map than an infantry-only battalion. Make sure to have fuel available to any battalions with vehicles in them. Otherwise, without fuel, those battalions will incur an enormous movement penalty that infantry-only battalions do not have to worry about. This leads us into our final segment concerned with the overworld, but specifically how battalions are supplied. Selecting a battalion and then clicking the Supply tab at the top of the battalion screen will show a list of resources. The ones on top will be white and the lower ones will be grayed out with negative signs next to them. The resources on top that have white text are the resources your battalion already has and is using or will use while it is deployed, moving around the battlefield, and or battling other battalions. The resources with gray text and minus signs are the resources your battalion would like to have to run at peak performance. A battalion can still function even if it has next to none of these required resources, but it will be extremely limited in its capabilities. Along with the fuel for vehicle example earlier, a lack of ammo, food, or alcohol can lower a battalion's capabilities, but if left for too long without any support, that battalion may rebel and go to war against you. Because of this, it's best to keep your battalions at least partially supplied at all times, so they continue fighting for your faction. To quickly supply a battalion, bring them to any town in your territory, click on the battalion, go to its supply tab, and in the lower left hand corner, click the supply icon. This will automatically fill that battalion with as many resources as are available in that town. If you are playing on lower economic difficulties, the supplies will be drawn from the global pool, and will have a greater ability to fully supply that battalion. Keep in mind that aside from using convoys from the convoy menu in towns to resupply a battalion with ammo or fuel, battalions can only be fully supplied while inside a town. As mentioned before, battalions can be used to attack, defend, intercept, or stand by to protect and expand your borders. But what happens when you need to do any of these things and how does combat occur in total conflict resistance? First, you will need an available battalion, and an enemy battalion to fight. Selecting your battalion and right-clicking on your chosen target will have your battalion start moving towards it. Affirmative. Once you reach your target, a screen will appear Attack. giving the details of yours and your enemy's battalion. The number of soldiers, vehicles, squads, and the area the battle will take place in are all shown. Below this are the manual and auto battle buttons. After clicking the Manual Battle button, you will then be transported to the Tactical Battle RTS mode for Total Combat Resistance. Here, you will be able to command and control every unit in your battalion. You can even join them on the ground in first person to help, as you can see when first spawning onto the map. This can be changed by pressing M on your keyboard. We will go back to first person mode soon enough, but first let's go through the third person experience. As many of these elements are available in the FPS mode, but can't be used as effectively. In the third person tactical view, you can see the entirety of the battlefield you will be fighting on. You can move around using the W, A, S, and D keys, and you can rotate the camera using the Q and E keys. Unlike the overworld map, there are only two UI elements on your screen. To the lower left of your screen, you will see yours and the enemy's faction symbols, along with how many remaining men are in combat. If this number drops down enough, the battle will end. To the upper right and down, you will see your individual squads that are currently on the battlefield. These can be selected by pressing any of the 10 number keys above your keyboard, 1 through 9 and 0. If you want to select all, press tab. Selected squads will have a green outline around their members. You can also select squads by left clicking and dragging your mouse. A box will appear that will allow you to select all squads within it. If a squad is selected, on the left side of your screen, a list of keyboard shortcuts will appear that will allow you to give your squads commands based on what is occurring on the battlefield and what you want them to do. 
A simple movement command can be done by highlighting a unit and then right clicking on the battlefield where you want that unit to move to. You can queue up orders by selecting a unit and holding the shift button and clicking where you want the squad to move to using multiple waypoints. The squad will follow each waypoint in order they are given. You can even continue to hold the right mouse button and move your cursor to change the direction that unit is facing. This is shown by the three blue arrows on the terrain down below. When selected, you can even order units inside of a building to take cover by finding a building that can be garrisoned and right clicking. This is shown as a white open door icon on buildings that can be garrisoned. Another command you can use is the dismount vehicle command. If you have any transport vehicle squads in your battalion and on the battlefield, selecting them and pressing J will have them disgorge their troops. If you hold down a squad's corresponding number key, a radial menu will appear with options for what you can do with that squad. This can be expedited by selecting a squad and then pressing the F key. There are a few tactical options the radial menu provides. Amongst them are the ability to order troops to stop firing or have them go prone to avoid gunfire, to name a couple. One of the unique aspects of Total Convict Resistance as a strategy game is the ability to fight on the ground with your soldiers to help turn the tide of battle. The direct control option in the radial menu allows you to do just that. Selecting the direct control option will let you select any member of the squad you have selected. You can also see what weapons they are carrying into battle, so you can choose the right loadout for your needs. Once selected, you will be back inside the FPS mode you started the battle in. Once in control of a soldier, you will see the same two UI elements of the RTS mode, but with one additional HUD element. Below the squad list on the right side is your currently controlled unit's weapon ammo counter, available ammo, and your soldier's health below that, along with any grenades that unit is equipped with. You can fire your weapon by pressing the left mouse button, aim down sights with the right mouse button, reload with R, throw grenades with G, lean left and right with Q and E, switch weapons with T, interact with weapons and vehicles using F, and crouch, go prone, stand up, or jump with C, Z, and the spacebar, respectively. These can all be changed in the key binding menu as needed. The last notable item from the first person mode is that the enemy is highlighted when looked at. This option is toggleable and can be changed by pressing the escape key, going to options, and then gameplay options. Here, you can go to the highlight the enemy option and change it to always on or off. You can also see a few other options that can impact your gameplay. Adjust these as needed. Once you have won or lost a battle, a screen will appear showing you the loot or trophies you collected from the battlefield on the left and if you have victory or defeat on the right. If you lost the battle, your battalion is destroyed and the trophies you see will go to the enemy. On the right, you can see the name of your battalion, its casualties and vehicle losses, if any, and below that will be the enemy's battalion stats. Click the continue button 
and you will be brought back to the world map. Here, you can go to the supply tab in your battalion, and unless the battle was for a town, you will see all of the loot you earned from that battle in your battalion supply screen. If you then bring that battalion to a town, it will automatically drop off all of the loot into that town, and then it can be equipped by your squads for use in future battles. Headed back to the battle screen before we selected the manual battle option, if we select the auto battle option, the screen will disappear and yours or your opponent's battalion will also disappear. If yours stays on the map, congratulations, you won the battle and get the rewards. Like the manual battle, these need to be taken to a town before the battalion can use them in its squads. Just like the manual battle, these need to be taken to a town before the battalion can use them in its squads. Keep in mind that auto battles will generally result in higher losses and waste of resources than manual battles will, so be extremely careful when selecting this option. The very last thing we need to discuss in this guide is capturing a town. This is very much like a normal battle, except upon defeating the enemy, you not only get the loot from the fallen soldiers, but also an entirely new production center. Along with this is also the chance to capture an incredible number of supplies within the city you can use to rearm, reinforce, and resupply your own military and population. Capturing a town does make it an extremely enticing target for your enemies to want to retake, so make sure to have the necessary manpower ready for any counterattacks. Congratulations! Combined with part 1 of this guide, you have now learned practically everything there is to know about Total Conf Resistance and how the many elements both in the world map and tactical map work together. See you on the battlefield, Commander.